Check, check. So, good morning. I am ready to be awakened to God, to be renewed in the mind, to grow more and more in love with my Creator and my Master. And I know, and I hope you are too. We've been reading Isaiah 65 in our Bible study in the last few weeks. And just that picture of God who is spreading out His arms, even to a nation that does not want Him. And He says, here I am, here I am. And this morning, I hear Him inviting us to come. To come and bow before Him, our hearts already surrendered letting him work with us as he please. So I invite you to do just that, to stand and come and join, and let's worship our God.
Jesus, you've said that if anyone wants to come after you, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow you. We acknowledge you today as our King, our Savior, our Master, our all in all.
Psalm chapter 90, starting at verse 11. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. God, our days on earth are short. Help us make it count. And thank you, because this is not dependent on our own strength, our own ability, our own wisdom. We rest in your promise. We rest in your faithfulness. We rest in your unfailing love. You carry us. You've carried us. And you will do it again. Walking around these walls. I thought by now they fall, but you have never failed me yet. Waiting for change to come, knowing the battles won. For you have never failed me yet Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my confidence You've never failed me yet I know the night won't last Your word will come to I will sing your praise again Jesus, you're still enough Keep me within your love My heart will sing your praise again Ah 
May take your seats. We praise God because we are reminded that as we worship God, our worship is not dependent on what circumstance you are going through right now, what the world is saying to us, but it is rooted and grounded in the very fact of who God is in His Scripture and what He has been faithful in doing. And we thank God for how he is ushering our hearts over and over again to go back to the reality of who he is and who we are as his church. Good morning, IBC family. It's a great joy to welcome you again. And to those who are joining us here in the sanctuary and to those who are joining us online, um, what a great joy to gather uh, together as saints redeemed by the blood of Christ, gathered as one. And we look forward that to those who are watching and joining us online, that there will come a time that we can also gather with us live here in the sanctuary, Makati. Join me at this very moment as we pause and pray and ask God to continually lead our hearts to him.
Listen to the words of the psalmist in Psalm 9. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exalt you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Sing praises to the Lord who sits enthroned in Zion. Tell among the peoples his deeds. God, you are wonderful. You are altogether lovely, gracious, loving, faithful, sovereign over all things. And even God in our own lives today. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness in ushering, Lord, our hearts and our minds to continually exalt Christ. And even, Father, as your people, reminding us of your good promises that is rooted in your steadfast love. Father, forgive us if there were moments, Lord, this week that we've been tempted, that we allowed, Lord, unbelief to settle in our hearts, and we ask for your forgiveness and your renewal to be upon us today. And as you give your forgiveness, Father, we thank you for Christ. For he is perfecting our hearts so that we can come to him and allow him, Lord, to restore our inmost being. Father, we thank you for that grace. We thank you for the power of your word that illumines us, Lord, to the path that you have prepared for us even before the foundation of the world. We thank you for the work of the Spirit that is faithful, Lord, to redirect our affections to you. Thank you, Father. And Lord, even at this time, we recount all the wonderful deeds that you have done in our lives. Not just, Lord, in the area of providing for our needs, physical and a daily, but God simply remembering on how you saved us from darkness, to light from being slaves of sin and now slaves of righteousness from being an enemy of God before and now a child of God Father we thank you for that grace that we are experiencing today and as recipients of grace Father we thank you that we can now share it to others that we can sing your deeds to us Thank you, Lord. And thank you, Father, for allowing us, Lord, to be your church in these crucial times. Thank you for allowing us, Lord, to preach the word in season and out of season. Allowing us, Lord, to gather as your people. Allowing us, Lord, to make disciples, Lord. Allowing us, Father, to also encourage others in the faith. Allowing us, Lord, to mobilize other churches for your name's sake. All these things, Lord, it's your work. And thank you, Father, for giving us the opportunity to partner with you. What a humbling privilege. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. And we even ask right now, Lord, that as uh, we prepare ourselves to listen to your word, we ask your spirit to be our teacher and our guide, and that you will provide illumination, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that will make us more Christ-like and will prepare us more to be your church in this dark, lost world. Thank you, Father. Thank you for today. And thank you, Father, for how you're going to minister to our hearts. Thank you, Father, for how you're going to train 
our hearts and our minds to love you, to delight in you. Make our hearts, Lord, expectant of what is ahead because our future is brighter in Christ and we have confident hope that He is going to accomplish what He has started in us. Thank you, Father. Thank you for our time together. And thank you for how your name will be known and will be glorified in our midst. In Christ we pray. Amen and amen. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the privilege of being able to pray for my country, Afghanistan. God, I don't know where to begin, but you work in wondrous ways, and your ways are always beyond our understanding. Lord, in this time of hurt and pain, I lift up my people, the people of Afghanistan, in your presence. Lord, you know that a complete takeover of Afghanistan by the Taliban have left many people broken and hopeless. It has left many dreams uh, shattered and many lives lost. Lord, I pray that you be hope for the hopeless. You be the healer to all those who are broken inside. Lord, I pray for the crumbled economy and healthcare system that have left so many families without food and any healthcare. Let your abundance and mercy be known so that all those who are hungry may find food and all those who are sick may find healing. God, I pray for all the human right abuses in Afghanistan. I pray for the right of education of Afghan women. I pray for the right of Afghan women to be able to work and provide for their children. I pray for the right of our women to be able to dream. I acknowledge that as a nation we have sinned against you. We have always repelled your truth and we have murdered your people and have burnt your church. Lord, please have mercy on us. I pray for your church that you have established in Afghanistan among Afghans. Embolden us, strengthen us, give us wisdom and courage so that we could carry your truth to the other Afghans around us. Lord, when you were on Calvary, on that cross, everything seemed dark and hopeless, but you turned what seemed to be defeat in the eyes of humans to our greatest victory. And so, in full faith, I believe that you will turn all this hopelessness into a greater victory for your kingdom. I believe that just as you turned Saul into Paul, a murderer to an evangelist, so will you work in the hearts of the Taliban. I ask you, Father, in the name of your Son and our Lord Jesus Christ, that there may come a day when the children of Taliban will become your followers and your evangelists, an instrument of your hand for your glory. May they go to further parts of the world and carry your message with them. May in everything your name be honored and glorified. In Jesus' mighty name, I ask all this prayer. Amen. to God in prayer. Our God who's loving, who's eternal, and who's all-powerful, we come to you this morning and we lift up to you the country of Afghanistan. O Lord our God, we know and we believe that you are fully at work in this country. It is always heartbreaking, O God, to see what is happening in this country. 
But we also, need, we also know, God, that you are the one who's able to save them. So, Lord, I pray right now, we plead as a church. I pray, God, that you will open their hearts, their ears, that they may come to know you as their Lord and Savior. I pray, God, that you will soften their heart, especially those people who are doing evil. I pray, God, that you will convict them of their sin and that you will just provide them awakening, O oh Lord, that what they're doing is against the God who created them. Lord, I remember your word in Genesis when you have created everything and you said it is all good. And I know, God, that you are the one who can still redeem these people. And I know, God, that you are on the move of redeeming them right now. So I pray, God, I pray, God, with confidence. I pray that you will bring forth salvation to this country. Oh, God, who have divided the deep sea, it is only you. And so, God, Nothing is impossible to you, even how hard the heart of the people, oh God, you can always bring them into the light, into you, oh God. So Lord, I pray right now for the men and women who are suffering in Afghanistan. I pray that you give them temporary comfort. I pray that you give them peace. I pray, God, that you mobilize your church all around the world to provide them health care, to provide them food, and to help this the children, the women who are suffering right now. We don't know exactly, God, where they are, but we pray, and I know that you are fully at work. I pray, Lord, that you will also protect them against the work of the enemy. Those men, God, who would, uh, do such things, bad things, Lord, I pray that you will speak to them. I pray that you will um, convict them even in all means, God, with their, in their dreams or whatever, Lord, show yourself to them that they may be able to know that you are the God who loves them and, to, and who cares for them so much. And so, God, I pray as a church that we will continue, God, to abide in your word, abide in you in prayer and in your church, that we may continue to be part of this, um, for, uh, part of redeeming people back to you, O oh God. Lord, Help the country of Afghanistan. Save them from themselves, O oh God. And I pray, God, for those Christians who are already there. I pray for spiritual courage to be upon them. I pray, God, that they will stand firm in the faith, even in the midst, in the midst of trouble and chaos. I pray that you will sustain them through the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray for your grace and mercy to be overcome by them. And so, God... We lift them up to you and with so much confidence in our heart that you will be with them. It's in Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. We continue to worship with our finances. And I'm glad to say that this is our uh, update for today how God has continued to provide all our needs. And um, thank God for, I know that our stewardship team had a, a meeting yesterday and looking forward to hearing from them later today. Um, some announcements. Again, we want to keep all our church family posted about um, important news and plans for the next few months. So would you please save this date? This is already this coming Sunday, February 6 at 2 p.m. And this will be a hybrid meeting. You can join us here in our church campus at 90 people capacity or log on to Zoom with these meeting details. And we hope and to see you there. And now let's... Come and open our scriptures and read together. Let us all please stand for the reading of the scripture. And let us open our Bibles to Mark chapter 8. 
I'll be reading from verses 11, verses 11 to 21. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. Now they had forgotten to bring bread, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, Twelve. And the seven for the and the seven for the four thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, Seven. And he said to them, Do you not understand do you not yet understand? May the Lord bless for the reading of his word. You may be seated. Thank you, Jerry. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, this is your word, and we submit ourselves to it, asking you to speak to us very clearly today so that we will have eyes to see, so that we will have ears to hear, so that our hearts will be soft and obedient. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we come to this passage of Scripture, and once more, we see Jesus in a confrontation with the Pharisees. How often does that happen? It seems like at every turn of the path, Jesus is confronted by these Pharisees, and it happens again. Jesus and the Pharisees. That sets the context for what the Holy Spirit wants us to learn and what Mark has written for us to learn the story of Jesus and the Pharisees and the disciples. So in this conflict with the Pharisees, they argued with Jesus. They intended to examine Him, to dispute Him. And that always seems to be their strategy. They always are wanting to question Jesus' credibility. They demanded a sign from Jesus, a sign from heaven. Now, there's a lot wrong with their demand. First of all, what more did they need to see? What more did they need to observe to prove that Jesus was from God? They already saw Jesus drive out demons, heal the sick, raise the dead, and twice feed thousands of people with a little bento. Bread and fish. And there were leftovers. Massive amount of leftovers at each feeding. Either they were very ignorant, very stubborn, or extremely impossible to please. Probably all three. The other problem was the type of sign that they demanded a sign from heaven. A little bit of research this week opened my eyes to something I'd never seen before. In that culture, in that day, in the Hebrew life, a sign from heaven referred to some big, apocalyptic, dynamic, dramatic event in which God would pour His wrath out on the enemy of Israel and set them free. It's the kind of signs that we see in the book of Exodus. What they wanted Jesus to do was crush the Romans. 
and establish Israel's sovereign political empire in that land again. Of course, I have an idea that in the back of their minds was also their own power, their own political agenda. They wanted their own power and place to expand and to grow stronger. I'm sure that was part of their consideration. So we see in this encounter with Jesus that the Pharisees were concerned with their own advancement, not the advancement of God's kingdom. They were thinking politically, nationally, not spiritually. They lost the entire reason why God sent the Messiah, why Jesus came. So, since Jesus did not fit their mold, they, their only interest was to discredit him. To prove to the crowds that he was nothing more than a charlatan. They knew, really, they knew that Jesus was not about to crush the Romans. I mean, what army did he have? Those 12 unexceptional men who traveled around and followed with him? I think not. So they were really asking Jesus to do something that they knew he wouldn't do. Well, Jesus was not about to play their game, was he? (sighs) He sighed deeply. In other words, he was tired. He was exhausted, maybe even bored with their continued attempts to try to test him, to tempt him. But I think also he was struck with deep, deep grief by the apparent spiritual dullness of the supposed spiritual leaders of Israel, God's people. He even voiced his dismay of their spiritual blindness. Why does this generation keep seeking a sign? Maybe Jesus had in his mind his recent journey through Gentile territory. If you remember, there were no signs needed there. Jesus did wonders. He performed miracles. But no Gentile asked him for a sign. They simply brought their sick They're demon-possessed, they're lame, they're blind to Him. What He observed was the kind of simple faith that one would expect from Israel, especially the Pharisees. I think there's a little hidden agenda in Mark here. I think Mark wants us to see that quite often in the Gospels, The least likely people are the ones who demonstrate extraordinary faith. And the ones that we would expect are as dumb as rocks. No sign will be given. Now, a little research this week revealed to me something that I had never seen before. What Mark has done here, he has quoted Jesus pronouncing an oath. We don't easily see it, but Mark's readers would have seen it. What Mark has done has not included the entire oath. He has left out a portion. There's a blank in here, which his readers would have been able to fill the blank with the formula. The formula in, in an oath this was to first pronounce some sort of curse against yourself. Something like, may God strike me dead, or may I be cursed, if. So when you put that all together, Jesus was probably saying, may God strike me dead, or may I be cursed, if ever a sign is given to this generation. So Jesus was really saying that Not only will no sign be given, but he will do all he can to make sure that it's not given at all costs. We get to verse 13, and Jesus has no interest in entertaining the Pharisees. In fact, Jesus has no interest in entertaining the selfish and misguided demands of the world. So he 
left the Pharisees behind, probably with their jaws on their chests in other amazement, and he gets into a boat with those twelve unexceptional men. Now, if we've been paying attention as we have journeyed through the Gospel of Mark, we will have noticed that every time Jesus and the disciples get in a boat, there's a lesson to be learned. It's a teachable moment. The disciples are going to learn something new about themselves, and Jesus is going to reveal something new to them about Himself. This is actually the third boat scene in the Gospel of Mark. Scene number one is in chapter 4. Verses 35 to 41. If you remember that scene, Jesus calms the sea and rebukes the wind. And then He rebukes the disciples for their lack of faith. From the terror of the storm to the wonder of Jesus' power, the disciples are filled with wonder and curiosity. And they ask themselves the question, who is this guy who can stop a storm? Scene number two happens in chapter 6, verses 45 to 52. Once again, the disciples are overcome by fear and terror. Jesus sees them straining at the oars while He's praying on the mountain and they're crossing the sea. He comes down to them and walks toward them on the water and they're scared to death, think they're being approached by a ghost. Jesus says, hold on there guys, it's me. The calm comes, and Mark explains that the reason they were afraid was that they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. This came just after the feeding of the 5,000. And here we are in scene number three, just after the feeding of the 4,000. In this boat, Jesus has just fed 4,000 people or more, with seven loaves of bread. So far, think about this, the disciples have had the experience, the unique opportunity to witness the identity of this man who stops the storm, stops illness, stops demon possession, stops hunger, and even stops death. We'd think that by now, the disciples get it. We'd think that by now, they could answer their own question, who is this man? But they have made very little, if no, progress in their spiritual comprehension of who Jesus is. So when Jesus got in the boat, He found them arguing about, wait for it, bread. Now, listen carefully to verse 14 again. The disciples had forgotten to bring any bread. They only had one loaf of bread in the boat with them. Does that strike you as funny? Interesting? Could it be that Mark is giving us a clue about the lesson the disciples are about to learn in this experience? Hang on to that thought. We're going to come back to this verse later in the story. In verse 15, we see Jesus taking charge of this teachable moment, as He always does. First, He warns them. In fact, He actually gives them an order, an instruction, strict orders. Watch out! Now, we've said that before, right? All of, us, all of us have said that. That's what you say when your child is about to chase the ball in the street. That's what we say when we're in the passenger seat and the driver's not paying attention and they're moving either towards this, this side or that side and we say, watch out! I've heard that before. That's what we say when someone's about to step in a hole. Watch out! That's what we say when we see someone is moving toward risk. Watch out. And that's what is happening here. The disciples 
need to wake up because they are at risk. What risk? Beware, Jesus says. Beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Now, I know in some translations there is the word yeast, but it's not really the word yeast. A better translation is leaven. There were two different things. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Beware. What in the world does this mean? The disciples should have known. But they are so focused on bread, not having any for their boat ride, that they had no idea what Jesus was talking about. In verse 16, we see they're still discussing that they did not have bread. The word discussion there means to reason together. They're trying to figure out what went wrong. What happened? Why didn't so-and-so grab some bread from one of those seven baskets and bring it with us on the boat? They're confused. They're frustrated. They're blaming each other. They're arguing. They're discussing that they didn't have any bread. And Jesus was trying to get their attention to teach them a spiritual lesson, to stop them from walking into risk. But they can only argue that they had no bread. They were thinking about bread. So when Jesus mentioned leaven, they, they thought he was talking about bread too. But he wasn't. He wanted them to see what the Pharisees and Herod refused to see. So Jesus began asking them questions to try to turn their attention from bread to bread. Real bread. A different kind of bread. Not the bread they and we might be thinking of. The first question Jesus asked was why they were arguing about bread. Can't you see these disciples scratching their heads, confused, wondering in their minds, but not saying it out loud? Is he ignorant about our situation? Does, doesn't he, hasn't he been listening? Doesn't he know that we forgot to bring bread and he's asking us why we're discussing that we don't have bread? Is he unaware? Why would he tell us not to get bread from the Pharisees or Herod? They're so confused. So Jesus pushes the point a little bit deeper and adds some more personal questions. Don't you understand? Aren't you aware? You have eyes to see. Why can't you see? You have ears to hear. Why aren't you listening to me? Are your hearts that hard? Don't you remember? All these questions serve the purpose of trying to wake up the disciples to the risk at hand. Actually, they are already snacking on the leaven of the Pharisees and Herod. So what did Jesus mean by leaven? The leaven of the Pharisees and Herod. In the Old Testament, there was yeast which is a natural ingredient in the world. It's an enzyme. In fact, the Hebrew word is zyme. It's an enzyme that gives bread when added. It, it rises, it doubles, and it gives bread that, that light texture, that pleasing aroma, and that savory taste. Leaven, on the other hand, was produced by pinching off a piece of yesterday's dough, setting it aside, and then the next day, when it's time to bake bread, you add a little juices to that dough that promotes 
fermentation, and then you add that to a new batch of dough to make bread. Sounds like a good idea. But the problem is that leaven is easily tainted. If it becomes tainted and you mix it with a new batch of dough, you've just poisoned the next loaf of bread. And then if you continue that process, it gets worse and worse to the point at which, at the least, your household has food poisoning. So in the Bible, leaven is a symbol of corruption. It's the symbol of spiritual poison. It's the symbol of sin. It's a symbol of the infectious power of evil. What was the poison of the Pharisees and Herod? Okay, stop here. Go back to those first two boat scenes. Why did Jesus rebuke the disciples? Lack of faith. Unbelief. In the second boat scene, what did Mark say was the reason for their fear? They didn't understand about the loaves because their hearts were hard. That's the poison of the Pharisees and Herod. The Pharisees had seen enough demonstration that Jesus is the Messiah. Herod had a strange relationship with John the Baptist. He was very curious about John the Baptist. He loved to hear John the Baptist teach. He would bring him, sit before him, and listen to John the Baptist teach and preach. But when John warned Herod that marrying his brother's wife was a immorality and a sin, Herod refused to believe what John was saying. And he eventually cut John's head off. And later, Herod wants to be entertained by Jesus. He was very curious about this man called Jesus. He, he wanted Jesus to do something to entertain him. He wanted to hear Jesus teach. Jesus refused to play that game, so Herod sends him back to Pilate, who had Jesus executed. The leaven that Jesus is talking about is hardness of heart and unbelief. They are extremely poisonous. Remember. Remember what? Watch out. Beware. Remember. Don't you remember? Remember what? Jesus asked His disciples, why all the squabbling about the loaves? And then gives a quick recap of recent events that should have jogged their memories and it should jog our memories. He prods them to recall how much was left over when he fed the 5,000 and the 4,000. And I can, I, I can imagine this scene in the boat. I, I'm sure the disciples were so proud of themselves to have the answer. How many baskets were left over when I broke the bread and fed the 5,000? Twelve! How many baskets were left over when I fed the 4,000? Seven! They saw the numbers, but they didn't see the point. They actually helped distribute the bread. They helped gather the leftovers. Twelve baskets. Seven baskets. Though they had a ringside seat at both events, it has apparently slipped their minds and they come off as... Well, one scholar says dunderheads. I'm not sure what that word dunderhead means. Maybe it's a mild word for... Well, I won't say that word. They're just really dense. They're 
heads are hard, their hearts are hard, they can't hear or see the spiritual truth that is happening all around them. All they're worried about is that they don't have enough bread for 13 people. And even when Jesus refreshes their memory, they still don't comprehend because their hearts are hardened by two things. Self-focus about worldly concerns like bread and unbelief. They're, they're mired up in their own little world with its little concerns and they cannot see God's reign breaking through right there in front of them. Just like the Pharisees and Herod and so many others. Actually, just like you and me. But Jesus does not give up. Look at verse 21. Don't you understand yet? That's a little clue from Mark that Jesus is holding out hope for these 12 unexceptional people. He's holding out hope for them to come to understand, to see, to perceive, to believe. The not yet implies that eventually they're going to get it. Eventually they're going to understand. Eventually they're going to see and hear. Eventually their hearts will be soft and broken and open. Unlike the Pharisees and Herod, their problem was that they, the problem was not that they refused to understand, but they, they just could not, but they will. When Jesus dies on the cross and rises again on the third day, it's going to be a magnificent aha moment. They're going to finally understand. Now, let's come to some conclusions. How this story, how this encounter with Pharisees and Jesus' pleading for 12 disciples to understand, how can that relate to? to us. Here's what I think. I think this story does its real powerful work in us when we see our own blindness in the blindness of the disciples. If we ask the question, how could these disciples be so dense? We need to immediately ask the same question of ourselves because sometimes we are just as dense just as mired in our own little world concerns and can't see Jesus standing right there in front of us, engaged, involved in our lives. When the disciples become consumed with worry that they don't have enough bread, we correctly ask, why should they feel so insecure? They travel with one who already has shown his care for them, and He has the power to satisfy all of their needs. They worry about all the wrong things. We should immediately see that our petty worries in our lives today often look just as silly and unnecessary and ridiculous. Now, Let's go back to verse 14, shall we? That little clue in the story that Mark wants to catch our attention with. But the disciples had forgotten to bring any bread. They only had one loaf of bread with them in the boat. Why the contradiction between one bread and no loaves. If they forgot to bring bread, then how could they have one loaf in the boat with them? Do they not even know that they have the loaf? Or do they think that one loaf is insufficient for their needs? 
Here's what I think. I think Jesus is the loaf. I think Mark is teasing us by subtly referring to Jesus as that one loaf in the boat with them without any clear antecedent. In other words, there's no break. He goes from, Mark goes from there to Jesus warning them about the yeast of the Pharisees. So I think Mark wants us to recognize Jesus is that one loaf who can multiply one into abundant loaves of bread. Now, When we can see our own blindness, when we can see our own worry and anxiety, our own dense spiritual hearts, I think we come to conclude that there are several dangers that arise when we become like these disciples, focused on such worldly matters, focused on our own little world, material well-being, and so many other things that we can't hear, we can't understand the very clear word that Jesus is speaking to us. We begin to doubt the power of Jesus to provide enough, and we may be tempted to look at other sources. So when we get in a fix, when we get into a circumstance in which we lack, don't have enough, what's our first response? Good, we pray. But what if we pray for a while and we don't seem to get an answer? What do we do? Do we become doubters? Are our hearts filled with unbelief? Do we start seeking other sources to meet our need, like an aunt or an uncle or an older brother or a parent or a grandparent or a friend who has a better job and more resources? Or do we spread ourselves so thin by getting a second job or a third job or selling online? Or None of these things are immoral or sinful unless they become a replacement for the one loaf who loves us and wants to provide all we need. We need to learn that lesson from this story. Here's another risk. We begin to vent our frustrations, our anxieties by being quarrelsome with other people. And that undermines community. One of the symptoms of stress and worry is that we become bitter and quarrelsome. In fact, that often happens in the church. Sometimes things might not be going well. Maybe we don't have enough finances, and so we start blaming each other like the disciples. Well, preacher, if you could preach more about tithing, we'd have more money. Or we began looking around to make sure we, we watch when the basket passes, to make sure that people are putting money in the basket. We become quarrelsome. We start blaming each other for why things aren't going well. That's a danger. It, it disrupts community, and it takes our eyes off of Jesus Another risk. The never-ending pursuit of daily bread distracts us from obeying God's will. That can happen. That does happen. It's easy to happen. If the disciples would have only lifted their eyes I'm searching for loaves of bread, they would see that in the boat with them is the one loaf, Jesus, who is not only the bread of life, but provides bread for life. So I'm wondering... Do we have ears to hear? Do we have eyes to see? Do we have hearts that are soft and pliable? Whatever your circumstance now, whatever your need, whatever your challenge, 
whatever your frustration, whatever is happening in your life, we need to understand that right here in the boat with us is the one loaf, Jesus, who loves us, who has provided for us in the past, who has power to create abundance out of nothing, who has promised to give us bread for life. Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that you have taught us this morning of this wonderful truth. Jesus is bread for life. Correct us, Lord. Say, watch out. Say, beware. Remind us to remember when we forget this truth. When we become so focused on little things. If we become focused on self-preservation, expanding our own empire, seeking our own power, remind us of this story, of this lesson in the boat. Turn us away from poisonous leaven. Give us a hunger and a craving for your pure word. Feed us, equip us, inspire us, discipline us, correct us. Thank you for being patient with us. Thank you that in the not yet, you never turn your back on us. You stay in the boat. You stay engaged. You love us. You teach us. Thank you. And we pray in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to sing a song of commitment. Maybe this story has convicted you, as it did me when I was studying and preparing, convicted you of how often you and I become so focused on little things, become so doubtful, filled with hardness of heart and unbelief. Maybe the Holy Spirit has convicted you today while we're singing this song. You make a new, fresh commitment. Maybe you've never trusted in Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Maybe this is the day that you can repent of your sin. Believe that Jesus died on the cross for you and rose again. Believe that if you follow Him, He'll provide for your life. He'll give you eternal life because you are forgiven of all your sins and restored into a right relationship with God. So while we sing, this is a time of soul searching and commitment. So as we sing, let's make our commitment to the Lord.
O Lord, not to us, but to your name goes all the glory for your unfailing love and faithfulness. God bless you. Have a great afternoon. See you next Sunday.